This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives, both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And if you could, please do me a favor and take a moment and leave a rating and review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Heart Radio. doesn't matter. I'd greatly appreciate it, and that feedback really helps get other listeners to the show. Also, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to agutor.com slash tip and donate to the show. Thanks so much. All right, Geek Leaders, today I'm honored to have Jim Bishop on the show. Um, he is the founder of Conjunction Leadership, and he's had over 20 years of experience uh, with executive development, uh, corporate leadership, and human performance. So we're going to talk about that and how it applies to us as tech leaders. Anyway, with all that being said, Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks, John, for having me. If you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you got into leadership and why that's important to you. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, uh, 20 plus years in corporate environment trying to figure out um, the best place I could serve, right? Um, I went to school to be a scientist, actually trained in behavioral science and uh, physiology. And I got a, my first job out of college was to work in the technical space of helping customers apply our products. Um, what I recognized when I was out there working on that technical issues, um, most of the time customers didn't have any questions about the technical or the science. They only had questions about people. You know, our flawed and broken systems, and then we put flawed and broken humans in them, and then they tend to create a lot of chaos and confusion, and we don't know how to manage that because we can manage variability. And in other ways, what we can't manage is the differences in people. And so over the course of time, I found myself working in science-related life science areas, but I was always with the people bit. So I worked in leadership development, organizational development, training and development. I did a little bit of work in um, talent management, succession management, and eventually executive development, working with the CEO on, and the leadership team of a large prominent pharmaceutical organization. Um, it was during those moments that we had continued to try to put butts in seats and change the culture of the company through training interventions. And what we recognized was it really wasn't working because the system and the structure around us was, wasn't working. And the way that we needed to do that was to take one leader at a time through a coaching journey and have them not just pivot in their skill set, but pivot in their mindset. And then they could unlock a whole new way of relating and being for other people. Um, the pandemic helped a little bit with that as we all had to relate differently. But it also then gave me my greatest sense of voice and vision and said, it's time to bring this gift to the outside world. So in the middle of a pandemic is when I also chose to launch uh, my new business venture and go out there and create change with other leaders who were bravely in these spaces as well. Awesome. So, uh, would you say that the, uh, all the, cause during the pandemic, you know, and, and that's a whole, like for me, that's like a two or three year blur because we had, you know, everybody's, you know, working in the office. Now everybody's remote. And now we have, um, you know, some companies are coming back. Some are not, some are permanently remote. Some are hybrid now. And then there's this uh, great resignation that happens somewhere in the middle of that. And now we get to the point where we're kind of going into a recession and the great resignation is kind of over. How has all of that played out into, you know, the growth of your business? Yeah, um, actually, that's that was, all of those things were percolating in the midsummer of 2020 when I was contemplating what is my best gift to the world, right? There was this new way of relating all the social injustice that we were seeing in the world as well as just a new value put on our personal time as we didn't have the commute and we didn't have to do with many of the things that we were dealing with before. And what I recognized at that point in time, many of the leaders leading these organizations were so keen to focusing on how do we keep the doors open and how do we keep income coming in and how do we re-innovate our business model and the new way of not actually being able to knock on doors and sit face to face with people. Um, but what they weren't thinking about was how do I become a better human in the way that I'm leading? Because the employee value proposition completely changed during that period of time. And the things that employees expected and also desired in their work were kind of going unseen and unnoticed by many leaders. You know, the ability to talk about how they felt when they saw things on the television or the feeling of being connected to other people. Well, um, we had that in our workplaces before, but we didn't have that at, during the pandemic. So Really from 20, 21, 22, 
we've been adjusting to a brand new reset in terms of how people show up and what they expect from work. So that's actually been a great reason to uh, a great help, I think, in launching the business at that point in time. My my client base tends to be people who are maybe 15 to 20 years in their career, probably somewhere between the age of 37 and 55. What What is happening with them is they have learned to show up one way in leadership and the pandemic forced them to show up in a very different way. In order to get somewhere new, we have to forget or disrupt some of the things that we currently learned. As we disrupt some of those things that we learned, that also feels a little destabilizing. And part of my identity or my brand has to also be willing to adjust along with that. And there are some leaders who are willing to do that. And there are some leaders who are, which you've alluded to some of those challenges. We're either forcing people to come back to the work environment because that's the way that I choose to lead. Or we're allowing them to live in a more hybrid type of environment where work occurs wherever they choose to be, because I can pivot that way and be a leader in that regard as well. So, yeah. So I know for me and for several people that I've talked to, it it, it can be kind of difficult when you're used to leading in that in-person environment and having those in-person meetings. And then you go to a Zoom environment and it's, it's kind of like you miss out on some of those serendipitous moments where you just kind of bump into someone in the hallway, you ask how things are going, you see that they're having a rough day and you can talk about things. You don't really get that over, you know, Teams and Zoom, you know, on a regular basis unless you're really intentional about it. Um, what are some advice you would have for maybe um, someone starting a new uh, job in a leadership role that's fully remote and having to like kind of build those relationships and get to that point without kind of coming off as that creepy guy that's always just messaging you for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've hit the nail on the head there. And I think a large part of it is what is my belief, right? And in the workplace and the, when we were, we were face to face and we were interrelating, I didn't have to challenge my belief that much because what was happening was we just had that contact and that incidental time walking to the lunchroom or walking to the water cooler or sitting in the social hub. Those things tended to happen, but a lot of leaders still have the belief that that chit chat is just wasteless, useless time. And so if I hold that belief, then when I go into a Zoom meeting, it's let's get down to business because we don't have time to like waste. We don't have time to like socialize around this. We just need to get work done. This is where a part of that identity has to shift because I have to shift that belief that that time that we spent at the water cooler wasn't wasted. It was actually beneficial and it gave us certain things that maybe like lubricated the gears just a little bit and allowed things to move and allowed us to understand one another in a way that we couldn't so that when tensions rose or when difficulties hit, I'm able to give you the best, most generous interpretation of what's happening. What happened immediately during during COVID was people may not have had that belief. They thought if that was wasted time, every Zoom meeting started with, here's our agenda and here's what we got to get done. And we worked really diligently to do that. And we back-to-back Zoom meetings all day long and people started finding themselves burning out. It also then meant that we weren't really able to assess one another in terms of how do we interrelate. So best practices moving forward are just change your belief that that time can be productive And the way that you can make it productive is by the leader just displaying a little bit more vulnerability and emotionalness, right? If they start sharing at the beginning of the meeting or ask everybody to share something that they've learned this week, one, we're conditioning that learning is important and two, we're learning about one another. Or there's a whole host of checking questions that I use with some of my clients as they learn to relate differently that way as well. Yeah, I I mean, I see see that a lot and I, I can totally relate to the fact that, you know, you almost feel like when you're in the office, you know, you're there. So it's very obvious that you're at work. When you're remote, it's less obvious that you're at work. So we kind of had this tendency, at least at the beginning, to always be checking in, always be, you know, letting people know I'm I'm available, I'm here, I'm working, I'm at my desk, I'm not, you know, away. But then I know for me as a leader, I felt awkward and uncomfortable if I wasted someone else's time, you know. It may be valuable for me to have that, but am I wasting their time? Am I being annoying just, you know, sending them a quick call to see how things are going? Does it feel like I'm becoming a micromanager now? You know, how do we get past some of those, you know, perceptions that we might run into? Yeah. Well, I mean, you've just talked about some of your own beliefs, right? Uh, um, the way that I work with clients is we we start ideating around what do they want? And what are, What's the goal, Right. But it is a huge amount of what I call the three phases. The first phase is our disruption phase. The second phase is our bridging phase. And the third phase is our growth phase. 
most leaders will come to an executive coaching situation and say, I desire growth. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for them to go through the first phase to get that growth, which is disruption. And so you, you'll have to, you'll have to get comfortable with many of those things that you just talked about, the ideas and the, 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 the thoughts that this is not valuable or this is not productive, or I'm not comfortable doing this if you want to get to somewhere new. So a disruption of all of those beliefs are very, very important because once we destabilize things a little bit, we can reorder the pieces in a way that says, okay, here's how we do this much more naturally. Um, so a lot of the frustration that leaders feel is because they keep running the same play over and over and over again, expecting the same different results. And in reality is we have to kind of throw the deck of cards up a little bit to see how we can reorder them when they land. Um, and that's the first phase of it. My job as an executive coach is to mirror that back to the client. And when they show up a certain way with me, they're most likely showing up that same way with other people. And I can hold those things in tension with them and say, is this serving you? And this is how you want to show up? Or is there some way different? Mm -hmm. And in that, they get a better picture of maybe what an alternative path looks like. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so like for practical advice for a leader that's maybe, you know, you know, you're coming from an in-office situation and you're starting a job that's remote. You want to build those relationships up front. How would you recommend setting up one-on-ones and, and just having that time? What, what, what kind of cadence or agenda would you have for something like that? Yeah. Well, there's, there's um, many different reasons that people have one-on-ones, right? Um, I like to make sure that we accomplish many things in a one-on-one. -on -one. one of those is interpersonal relationships. And the second part of that is actually getting work done. And so, I think the frequency or the cadence of them needs to occur as quickly as your goals or your tasks are changing. Once once you have a reason to meet, you're going to be much more productive around that meeting. Secondly, how you meet is as effective as when, right? And many leaders will conduct a one-on-one -on -one because it's good for me. It's good for me as a leader to understand how to supervise and organize, and I need to know everything that you're working on. But if I'm the individual on the other side of that one-on-one, -on -one, it feels a little empty because all I'm doing is reporting to you everything that I already know that's going on. So it feels like I'm doing double work. If you reorganize that one-on-one -on -one so that it's good for the learner, it's good for the person in the one-on-one, -on -one, not just good for the leader, you would reorganize it in a way that says, what is your goal that you're working on? And what is the level of direction and support that you need to make that work? And you, you turn that into a productivity session so that when they leave, they actually have, they have more benefit than when they came in the room. Um, that to me is a better way of relating because as a leader, then you're not assuming everything that someone comes in your room with and going, okay, now I know everybody's task list. There's just no way that you can manage that. But if you let them go out of that one-on-one -on -one and you know that they're much more likely with the level of direction or support that you provided to get to the goal or the task that they've got on their plate, then what you're really doing is letting go and distributing power across the organization rather than trying to aggregate it so that you can report it back upwards. So I think we just have a fundamental challenge in the way that we conduct one-on-ones pretty universally today. So Yeah, I, th I think I think you're right. And I think um, one of the things you were kind of hitting around a little bit there is the, the um, idea of having transparency when you're having those one-on-ones. Because a lot of times leaders, they like to hear all the information, but they don't like to share a whole lot. And, you know, and part of that's because they feel like they can't be as transparent because they don't, you know, you don't want to show your own faults. You don't want to show what you don't know. You, you know, Sometimes you don't want to show what you do know about the company and the business and, you know, what's upstream. Um, but how, how important is it more, or is that more important being remote or hybrid than being, you know, in the office the way we used to do it? Yeah. Um, one might make the case that it has become more apparent since we're not face to face as much, but I think it's always been important for a leader to get, generate a following is for us to have a, a mutual symbiotic relationship between mm -hmm. boss and subordinate. Right. Um, I think there has been an outdated paradigm for many years that leaders have said, you know, the leader is the person that knows the most and can tell most people what to do. I think it's time for us to break that paradigm because if we can start distributing power and distributing um, the work around the organization rather than aggregating it, it's going to go much better with less people. Um, so I, I guess it's, I don't think it's been more important or less important. I think it's just become more apparent. So. Yeah. I, I think you're right about that. And I love the idea of, of, you know, distributing that, that, you know, the, the idea of the power and the, and the mindset, of it. you know, I always like to think about, you know, if, if, I have someone on my team that, um, you know, does one skill, maybe there's a cybersecurity person. 
I expect them to know way more than I do about cybersecurity and to advise it. But just because they know it, you know, unless I give them the authority to act on that, then I, I'm I'm still the bottleneck. I, I don't, I, you know, I can't scale a, as a department or as a group. Right. Absolutely. I wish we had more leaders like you. Right? <laughs> I think so. part of it is uh, I've, you know, s- struggled enough and and stepped to my own toes enough and been the the bottleneck enough times where I realized that you know I got to step back and realize that I can't. I can't do this. Yeah. I mean, I think if we were to look at the the definition of leadership over time, it's certainly changed. And we've gone from, you know, the commanding and controlling and organizing and planning part of being a leader, those people who could make the pieces of the puzzle fit together the best, to a leader who is much more catalyzing and coaching and visionary and architecture mm-hmm. is is much more important, where a leader can paint the vision of what the future needs to look like and know how to orient people to find their own path to get there. Um, that is that's the a preferred way of leading in the in the new way of working, if you will, right? When we're distributed across many different time zones, we're also not face to face in all of our situations. Um, if a leader can paint the vision and help people self identify how to get to that outcome, rather than organizing and planning and controlling their everyday actions so that everybody lines up to that, it's going to be much more freeing for the leader and much more empowering for the people who they are trying to work with. Yeah. And, and, you know, not just more empowering, but more motivating too. you know, when someone Absolutely. take ownership and have uh, some autonomy in how they do their job and what they do, you know, um, to get to that outcome. I think that, you know, motivates the employee, uh, you know, far greater than an inspirational speech can do. Yeah. I mean, I, I um, we work in executive coaching. We also work in um, team work um, and helping the teams come behind the leader. And then we work a little bit in culture. And oftentimes people will come to me and want the culture piece of it. They want to re-innovate and ideate about who it is. But in my mind, the model always starts with the leader and the leader goes first. The leader gets comfortable with new behaviors. And then many people come behind the leader and adopt those new behaviors because they see them working and that's the team part of it. And then once the teams do it, we just naturally get the output of the culture. But you can't really get that distributed power model where people feel motivated to take responsibility if the leader is got a mindset that says, I've got to congreg- aggregate the power and congeal it as the, at the top of the pyramid. So we, we bust that apart pretty quickly and help them say that, you know, a, a leader can get way further with way less resources when the people step up and take responsibility, but they're not going to step up if you don't know how to help them, if you don't know how to give them that responsibility. Um, Do you still see a culture or cultures out there where leaders try to um, lead with fear, you know, because they want all that power and they have to have it and they hold people to this, you know, unrealistic expectation sometimes, but they, you know, where where they say, oh, you should have done this, but if they do something without running it by the leader, then they're wrong. They're always going to be wrong. You know, do do you see that culture still out there or is that kind of like shifting away? Yeah. I mean, I... I see it. Now, I don't think it's as nefarious as maybe you're you're making it out to be. I don't think leaders intentionally lead with fear many times. I mean, there's probably the random rogues out there that do. Um, but in, in reality, high compliance type of cultures often or high SOP related cultures mm-hmm. often have that type of mentality because if we're putting pharmaceuticals in people's bodies or if we're regulating things that are um, meant for consumption or sometimes even in just process oriented environments, it's easier for us to routinize the system and manage the system than it is for us to distribute power and allow people to make some some mistakes occasionally. And so in those high compliance types of cultures, there is often a fear that if I go wrong, things could go south. And so there's always a almost a oversensitivity to the checks and balances of asking the higher order levels for approval. And when you do that, you just gum up the works because you're asking to tax the system with non-productivity all the time. Yeah, and I think we we see that we're starting to see that more and more in tech, especially now that uh, we've seen some CISOs get prosecuted from cyber breaches and things like that, you know, due to negligence. And that gets you know, now we have you know California Privacy Act. We have all these other states that are joining in with that. Um, and there's a lot more checks and balances with data that you know, us tech leaders have to kind of deal with now. So we're kind of seeing a segmentation where, you know, if I'm leading an entire tech org, I want my developers to be free to, you know, make mistakes to, you know, as Mark Zuckerberg said, break things, you know, move fast and break things. But I need my security and compliance in to be all buttoned up too. 
and make sure that the mistakes that are made over here don't affect this data over here. And it gets it gets really difficult to kind of juggle that sometimes. Yeah, I, what I hear in that story is just the need for leadership flexibility, right? One style is not fitting for every style of individual that you're working with. And as you're as a leader's responsibility grows, and they're not just leading a person, they may be leading a team, and then from leading a team to leading an organization, and then maybe from an organization even to leading multiple organizations, they've got to be able to diversify their leadership style because we're all at different points in our journey and the things that we need. Um, a lot of leaders have grown up with a mentality that you get what you get and you don't throw a fit because I have one trick and that's the trick that I ride. So Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, I think that's an easy... Uh you know, a uh, path to get into because you, you know, you did something and it worked well, you got promoted, you know, and, and I've told this story before, you know, I was a you know pretty good developer, got promoted, you know, now I'm managing developers and I sucked at that because it's a very different skill set. You know, uh, I went back to, I was thinking about when you said at the beginning how, um, you know, you can't manage everybody the same way. Well, as a software engineer, I like to write something that works, you know, every way. And yeah. I realized that, you know, oh, this works great for, you know, this employee. It doesn't work very good for this employee. And I've got to figure out why. Now, how do I do this differently? And then I realized that, oh, well, they're all individuals. So it becomes very challenging. And if you want a diverse team, which is, you know, great for productivity, great for everything, that means you have to manage diversely as well. You can't just do the same thing for everybody. And, uh, you know, learning that, you know, and struggling through that for a few years really helps you build that flexibility and agility, I think, as a leader that's necessary to, you know, expand. Yep, absolutely. You've just articulated my pivot from science into people, right? The science was easy because it's somewhat predictable. You know, variable X and variable Y sometimes are correlated. Uh, in human development and human organization systems, we show up differently every day based upon the way that what happened in our commute to work or what happened last night at dinner, or we might show up differently when we get a new boss, right? I mean, every every change is an opportunity for us to show up differently. And that makes the, the world of leadership very, very difficult because you're not leading a system, you're leading people. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any advice for people to help, um, you know, build off, build those relationships early so that you can, you know, sometimes you do show up bad. Sometimes you have a bad morning, you get stuck in traffic or, you know, some jerk cuts you off and, you know, beeps your horn at you, you come in angry or grumpy at work. H- how do you build those relationships so that when you are grumpy at work, you don't, you know, just ruin it for everybody? Yeah. Well, I mean, I building relationships is one thing, but I think it all starts at the heart of the leader, right? I see leaders who are overly reactive. I'll call it mm-hmm. that way. And yeah, we have world, we have systems and structure and some rules around us. And sometimes we learn to show up certain ways within those perceived rules. So some of us show up as an overly congenial, nice person. Some of us show up as an overly smart person who is going to outwit you. Others of us show up as people who can just multitask better than others and out strategize you. So what we're going to do is outsmart and outplan you. And if we work those things, those identities up to some point, they're helpful because I do need some intellect. I do need some relationship and I probably do need some work ethic. But when I rely upon those things too much in my overly reactive self is when you notice I'm getting grumpy or I'm getting agitated because what I'm doing isn't working. And, you know, and if we were just to use the language of emotions, anger is a secondary emotion. I show up angry because something else is happening. Usually what's happening is the thing that I've learned to do isn't working for me anymore. So what we have to do is one, identify it and two, learn how to pivot away from it. Use the gift of being reactive, but also author yourself into the creative mindset where it doesn't really matter if the guy cut you off. It doesn't really matter if you've had a bad morning because you're in control of most of the decisions that affect your life and you're authoring the better future that you desire to see. We all know when we operate in that space, we're just much more resilient and we can bounce through the difficulties of life much better. When I see a leader who is probably more agitated than usual, What generally means is we need to dip back into what's that reactive pattern that they've fallen into so that we can pivot to the creative side of it. And as they do that, their relationships will just naturally blossom. Yeah. Yeah. I know for me, like whenever I get in that, the situations where I'm grumpy and, you know, some, a lot of times it takes someone pointing out to me that I'm being grumpy (laughs) before I I discover it. My self-awareness isn't quite there yet, but whenever that gets pointed out that I am grumpy, I try to think back like, okay is this going to matter tomorrow? Is this going to matter next week? Is this going to matter next year? 
will I even remember this next week? I mean, I usually don't even remember what I'm wearing, you know, what I wore yesterday. <laughs> Probably won't. And then that kind of resets my, okay, yeah, this really doesn't matter. Let's just move on. And I don't need to be grumpy and make everybody else grumpy just because this thing happened that doesn't even matter anymore. Yes. That's such a healthy mindset. Again, I wish we had more leaders like you, right? Well, I, I do I, wish there was a way that I could uh, figure out that I'm grumpy without someone else. Any tips for that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, like I mentioned, anger tends to be a secondary emotion, right? And when you feel that heat rising, whatever that is, you may not know that you're grumpy, but you may be fixated on being right instead of mm. understanding someone else's point of view. You know, if if someone has honed that gift of intellect, as an example, and that's their superpower, then what they fear most is not being smart enough or being found out because they don't know something. When they fear that, they're going to show up a little more grumpy. Right. But underneath of it is because I fear being found out that I don't know the answer. If I'm a overly nice person and I've subordinated a lot of my own beliefs or my own opinions because I don't want to offend other people, then what happens is I might find myself being grumpy or irritated because I don't feel like I'm being known or heard. I don't have a voice. Right. And I've learned just to be too nice. On the other side of it, if I've learned to work out, outwork everybody and out strategize everybody, what I find is I'm probably grumpy because I'm too tired. What's happening is my mind never turns off because I'm always thinking three or four steps ahead of the curve. So I don't ever get backed into a corner because I don't want anyone to know that I can't, that they can outwork me. I want to be the one that always gets the, that my worth is equated with how much productivity I produce. Right. Right. So. What happens is you can identify those things much more likely than you can identify when you're grumpy because you know what your superpower is and you probably know when you're overusing it. No, I think you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head there. I can kind of relate to that. Uh, you know, there's so many times where I have this fear of being wrong. So I'll like dig in on a point and then I realize that like, it doesn't even matter if I'm right or wrong on this and I'm probably wrong. You know, so I, I've Luckily, you know, with chat GPT, I've kind of defaulted with, okay, let me ask chat GPT to see what they say. And I'll say, okay, well, I was wrong. <laughs> AI does. Well, you're, since we're on a tech podcast and we, we've gone there, I think that's a huge, huge space for many people who have that identity of, I've always been right. And in today's world, information is changing so quickly and we're finding out more and more. People who have honed that gift of intellect are going to quickly find themselves outpaced by the robots, right? Yes. Because- knowledge is no longer power. Knowledge used to be power when we didn't have as many people going to college or we didn't have as much information around us, right? And those that knew the most could actually have the most power. Um, but today, that's not going to be the case. Relationships, right? Having boundaries between ourselves and understanding one another, that's also something that we that people will fear is as we get into this greater connected world where people are working across boundaries and geographies, I'm no longer the person who has the most relationship power. Um, or even people who can outwork or outproduce you. The robots can also take care of some of our productivity tools, right? And so what's going to happen is people are going to have to rely upon their humanity to lead much less than some of those superpowers that they've honed over time because those are the things the robots can do for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we're seeing that more and more And today, you know, going back to outworking, you know, it used to be, you know, I, I could write this policy that would take me three or four days. Now, you know, I had someone just, you know, use ChatGPT to write an outline, send it out, and then, you know, we fleshed it out and got it done, you know, way quicker. And it's one of those things where, like, you know, you're realizing that the things that you were good at before aren't going to get you to the next level. You know, you've got to come up with something different. And I think that, you know, being able to build those relationship and this human skills skills to manage people and lead people is what's most important. Yep. The thing that the robots can't do for us is have empathy and connection, right? <laughs> At least not yet. <laughs> I mean, they can, they can use the language of emotion and they can use the language of empathy, but to know when to strategically place it based upon how I understand people and, and can read you or you can read me, there's nothing that can replace that human to human bond. So back to our previous conversation relating on Zoom, it's going to be even more critical, even yeah. more critical. So, so uh, do you do you see like uh, the work life balance? It used to be this idea like, oh, I'm leaving everything at the office and I'm coming home. But now that you're working at home, do you see that that becoming that becomes more of an issue for people that, that are remote and not being able to like let go and separate, or is that even a thing anymore? Yeah, I mean, we've um, you've used the word balance. I I just don't really like the word balance because it no longer exists, right? That implies an either or or a teeter totter. Yeah. Um, 
what I what I prefer is integration because mm-hmm. as a whole person, you show up every day as a whole person and you need to stay a whole person. That means you've got concerns for relationship. You've got concerns for finances. You've got concerns for your physical health. You've got all these things that go on in, inside of a person and you need to attend to them. And it's almost like a dashboard warning light system, right? If you're not attending to one of them, what you might be trying to do is over-function in the ones that you feel like you can control. Oftentimes, that's our career. So oftentimes, we try to over-function in our career because we believe that's where our greatest sense of worth and identity have come from. But what happens is as we do that, all the other warning lights in our life start going off. And so we feel like we're out of balance. But really, what we're not doing is integrating our life and our work. It all has to go together because the invention of the cell phone or uh, informatics and tools, it's all bringing it to the forefront where you have to be a person to to know how to manage this stuff. You can't just balance things anymore. So work-life integration is what I prefer. Yeah, I think that's that's becoming, you know, definitely the norm now, especially when you know, in the past, maybe you had a long commute. You could, you know, be frustrated at work and listen to music on your way home or an audio book and come home and kind of be in a good mood again because you've kind of gotten over it. But now we have, you know, these smartphones and, you know, you get a message and you can't help yourself because you feel your leg vibrate. You pick it up, you look, and it's from your boss. You're like, oh, like, you know, now you've got to deal with that or, or, you know, figure that out and talk about that and realize that, you know, what what happens at work is going to affect me at home. And what happens at home is going to affect me at work because, you know, I can't, you know, if if my kid's sick or, you know, they're doing bad at school, I'm going to take that emotional pain or whatever I'm struggling with into the office. Yep. Absolutely. I think one of the first exercises I do with a lot of executives is just to go through a mapping exercise and we take those dimensions of your life and we rate where you're currently at and then we rate where you want to be at. And all high performance people always say, I want to be at the highest end of the scale on all of them. Right. But in reality, ah, you know, it poses a difficult challenge. Can you be at the top of all of those all of the time? Well, Maybe I'm not saying you can't, but for a lot of people, they, they say, well, of course I need to be at the top of the scale in terms of finances as an example. Well, maybe their life is in such shambles that they actually do need more finances. But in reality is there's an insecurity there because a lot of people probably have the finances that they, that w- they can actually live a pretty decent life on, but that's what they know and that's how they know to work. So they put a lot of intentional effort on career because it leads mm-hmm. to finances, right? But what they're negating in that is they probably just haven't lost last year's Christmas rate and we're about ready to get to Christmas again. And they're already feeling bad about that. And so they let these things unattended in the rest of their life because they're so intensely focused on trying to earn more money. And if we help them see that, like, well, maybe you have the money that you need. Maybe what you need to be able to do is get some integration in the rest of your life and allow this thing to play itself through so that you're greater, you have greater resilience and greater wholeheartedness you're no longer going to be reactive to the power structures around you. You're going to be authoring what you want to see. But what's not happening today is you're working so over over functioning in that one regard that you're just not able to like pull everything else together as an example. So. so how important is it to have, you know, someone external from you walk you through these exercises and kind of point out the things that you don't realize is happening? Because I know, you know, for me, it's one of those things where I don't realize that, in, you know, like you said, if finances are your thing and, you know, you're making a lot of money and that's what you know, you want to keep making money because you have this fear of losing it. You know, maybe, maybe you have imposter syndrome and your fear of, you know, that you don't deserve to make the money that you're making or whatever it is. You focus so heavily on that, but you don't realize that you're focusing too heavily on that. How important is it to have someone from the outside kind of looking in and helping you out? Yeah. Well, for you're asking an executive coach that who's chosen <laughs> to leave a corporate career because I believe it's critically important. I mean, mm-hmm. Andrew John, I, I couldn't do it myself either when I was leading teams and leading organizations. I was so busy. You know, I have five kids. I was living a very full life at home. I was traveling a lot. I was on the road a lot. I'm serving clients. I'm serving my team. I'm trying to do everything I need to do to advance in my career. What I didn't have was that authentic mirror in front of me. I understood my intentions and I gave myself the best benefit of the doubt, like my intention of being gone all the time was to earn more money for my family and provide a better future. But what they didn't know, they only saw my action that I was never home, right? And Mm -hmm. in my being, there was this incongruence. Like I really wanted to be home. I really wanted to be there for their baseball games or basketball games or some of their school activities. Yet 
I was the provider and I was going out on the road as the road warrior to make sure that 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 I could handle that. But it's in those moments where a neutral third party can hold the mirror up a little bit and say, I see what you're doing and I hear what you want. These two things seem like they're incongruent with one another. I don't have to solve your problem. But when I speak that out loud, it, 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 you have the acknowledgement that I've been, you've been speaking that in your head for a very long time. Now that somebody else sees that, what it gives you the courage to do is step into it and go, how do I resolve this tension? And that's the name of the business is conjunction, because I feel like a lot of people put the butt in between those. I'm either going to be on the road or I'm going to be at home or I, I has to be on the road so that I can't be at home. But right. And if I put the and in between there, I can be the provider and be at home. How do I resolve that tension? When I get to the end, it forces me into a third option that says, maybe I need to explore ideas that I haven't currently seen. And so the and to me is the way that leaders get through that, but they are not going to do it by themselves because they have so much history built up and identity and they know their shame and they know their emotion. What they're going to do is just fight. But the truth of having a leader beside you or an executive coach is that I know you, I care about you, and I'm going to hold your best interest in, in in um, greater detail than you'll probably hold them for yourself. And I'll just hold the mirror up occasionally and go, I see what you're doing and I hear what you want. These two things don't seem like they're in congruence with one another. I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, I think it's been very helpful and, you know, wonderful thing to talk about, you know, especially the integration of work, life, you know, integration versus work, work life balance. I think that's a great, great way of putting it. Um, Jim, how can people learn more about, you know, conjunction leadership and connect with you online? Yeah, I appreciate that. I am most active on LinkedIn. Um, Mm -hmm. There are other social channels, but not very active there. But on LinkedIn, at least once a day, posting a thought or an article or a video of something that that I ponder, or maybe even a lesson from a coaching conversation that I just had. Um, My website also has blogs and information like that, downloadables and some things that you can find there. Um, If you want to read a little bit more about some power moves that midlife executives make, or if you want to read a little bit more about just some uh, blog comments or expository thoughts that I have here or there, but most active on LinkedIn. Um, likewise, anyone's feel free to send me an email, jim at conjunctionleadership.com. Um, I answer most of those and I am glad to get the connection from the outside world. So Awesome. I'll link that too in the show notes at geekleader.com so people can click through. Uh, jim, again, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please go to geekleader.com to learn more about what this guest is up to, click on their links, and connect with them online. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Make sure you've subscribed if you haven't already. And if you feel so inclined, you can leave me a tip by going to geekleader.com slash tip.